This is uh, Lucky Smith. Today is March 18th, 2012, and I am interviewing Mark. This is uh, for a Starver News magazine. Go ahead. And he had claimed uh, that he had an accident, that he got um, jilted during air conditioning work by some electrical wire or something that he electrocuted his hand his right hand and uh, that he wasn't able to move that hand so every time he went somewhere he went to a party or he met somebody he would shake the hand with a limp hand and everybody would go what the hell happened everybody moved the hand back yeah like like they were worried about hurting this guy the way he did it he acted like a victim yeah so he would pull they would pull the hands back and he would tell every single person that story what happened to him he can crab anything can hold anything and in my mind he was setting everybody up to be like an alibi for him not being able to hold a knife. If somebody ever asked, hey, do you know this guy named Mike? They would be able to say, oh, yeah, yeah the guy with the limb hand? Yeah, no, he wouldn't be able to do that. God, so, he, he, so he you could, think he planned every single move? Everything. He manipulated everybody. He would tell everyone how much he loved his ex-girlfriend that he beat up and, and how bad he feels. So people would think he's such a loving guy. And everybody I knew fell for this shit. They all said, no, he's a nice guy. Oh, my God, he loves this girl. I'm oh, like, trust me, I, I know people like this that. This guy is not a loving guy. He doesn't love anybody. You know, he loves himself. That's it. He doesn't love anyone. It's frustrating, right? Oh, it's terrible. Yeah, I, I deal with people. I falls for it. They all believe it. I deal with... There's always somebody in the circle like that, too, of, of friends that you're like, this guy's a piece of shit. This girl's a whore. But yes. then everybody looks at you like, what the yeah, hell? Like why? Wrong why? What's wrong with you? Like you, yeah. you, you, tr you try to bring them down or something. Like exactly. you're, jealous, you're jealous of something. Exactly. You're like, no. Yeah. Like, don't you see this person's fake? Yes. Yeah. Like I, you, I totally you, get. He's got something that you want. Or yes. Something. Yeah. Yes. I had. I, I dated some guy who exactly was like that. And and when not not like Michael, but like like all his friends are like sending him emails going, oh my god, you need to leave her. I'm like, oh, leave me. Like, why are your friends around. telling what? Leave, motherfucker! Mm. What? 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 Yeah. yeah. Everybody was treating me like like, like, like making me like a psychopath. Like I'm not stalking you, yeah. bitch. <laughs> that's that's how it was exactly with me. Everybody looked at me like I'm I'm up to no good because I'm saying these, these nasty things about this, yeah, this yeah. loving guy. You know, this loving guy. And and there were people that said, "Listen, Mark, Michael may have done some bad things in the past, but he has changed." He's a good guy. I know. I know Mark. Oh I know God. people. I know people, Mark. He's a good guy, and they believe this shit. And then after he got arrested, they, the same person that said that looked at me and goes, "Yeah, you know what? I always knew there was something wrong with him. I always, I, I, I kept my distance after you told me that you thought he was a serial killer, Mark. I kept my distance." Who said this? Or can you say? Or I I'm, I'm walking towards Starbucks. I'm a little cold. Yeah, that's good. Oh, okay. I can see. Okay, that's this, fine. Uh, and this person means a lot to me, even though I, I stopped talking to him because he thinks that Mike is, is still a good friend to him. So he still believes he's a good guy. How do you feel? How does all this make you feel? You befriended this Bad guy. You. you 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 were friends with him not for a couple months but years. I mean, how do you feel? Like like you loved him, right? At one point, like a brother. Like a brother, yeah. I saved him from getting beat up one time. I have a scar on my eyebrow right here. What happened? Can you talk? Can he you talk about fight. that story? No, he just got he he got jumped by by some people. We worked together at a nightclub for one night, and they wanted to beat him up, and I helped them out. And I broke my ribs. I fell off a balcony with with a two hundred twenty pound guy landing on top of me. Ouch! Breaking my ribs, getting my eye cut. Somebody kicked me in the face while I was on the ground. Oh and and he, he was laughing after this. He goes, oh my God, you looked so ridiculous going over the balcony there, falling <laughs> falling down those stairs. <laughs> he thought it was funny. I saved his ass, but he thought it was funny. Uh, yeah. <laughs> it was kind of funny. And was Michael violent around you? Not, not towards me, not around me. I mean, he would be a person that, that, uh, that probably bullies weaker people. From what I read, I don't, I don't know. I've never seen him see him do that but from what I read from his childhood people that knew him from his childhood but um, the way he talked to the girls that were submissive to him yeah he was you can tell he was violent you know he wouldn't talk to other guys like that just whoever he can control or yeah. or manpower uh, yeah and so he would think of himself as a great fighter and, 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 a, and, a, and, a, and a loving guy and an honest guy and somebody who knows everything that he, he knows about about 
uh, forensics. Every Saturday night, he would be at home watching America's Most Wanted. That was the most important thing for him. No matter what we were doing, he had to be home at 9 o'clock or whenever it was showing 8 or 9. On Saturday, he had to watch America, America's Most Wanted. That That's was his favorite show. Weird. Favorite show. So he thought he was an expert in forensics. He said, if I ever did something like that, I would get away with it because I know how. You know, and uh, what, else, what I was going to tell you one day, I don't know what year it was. Maybe, I don't know, one, maybe 99 or something, 2000, mm -hmm. he went to Chicago on vacation. And I had given him a dog that I found, a pit bull. We found together, actually, I caught the dog. It was still a puppy. And I had to watch the dog, and this guy, Mike, was gone for three weeks. He went to Chicago to visit, with his, visit uh, his family and everything. And I would be in his apartment every day to pick up the dog. And you sit there, you have all these dolls, all these crazy horror movie memorabilia and everything. And there was one doll that's about three feet tall, two, two to three feet tall. It was um, Mike Myers, like a doll, with a, like a coveralls, with blood everywhere, with a big bloody knife. And every time you walk by, a motion detector would uh, set off a girl screaming and the music from the Halloween, the soundtrack oh, would play. Oh, you told me, right? He had dolls, you uh -huh. said? He would collect he, them. He would collect dolls? Uh -huh. Like, like The Thing, Freddy Krueger, all these, they were all over the place and I would sit there. Did he make movies or, or no. Did, no, no. he had nothing to do with the film industry, he just collected yeah. horror stuff. Mm -hmm. I was watching, I was watching, uh, I would sit there to pick up his dog and I would sit on his bed and I would look around and I would, it would, I would get the weirdest feeling, the weirdest feeling. So three weeks later this guy comes back, I pick him up from the airport together with his dog. Yeah. And I let the dog out of the car, and Mike goes, Kiara, Kiara, come here, come here. Oh, we can go in, but I just was letting us finish. And the dog walks up to him, turns around, comes back to me, sits down, turns her back towards him, and looks at me. Never wagged her tail. Never cared about this guy. And right there, I trust these dogs. I trust pit bulls. I rescued pit bulls for over 20 years. So, what's the pit bulls and bad people? What's the connection? Or people no, this, this dog, I think, in my mind, just knew this guy was a, was, a, was a bad person. This dog just knew. This dog was the sweetest, one of the sweetest pit bulls I've ever seen. And she was not excited about this guy at all. At all. She would have gone with me without ever, ever looking over her shoulder and, and, and looking at this guy ever again. Jeez. You know, I'm not a big dog person, but dogs always crawl all over me. Yeah. Then once, one time I was at a party in Woodland Hills. And somebody had like this dog, and the dog jumped on my lap. And the guy said, "Oh, you must be a good person." I go, "Why?" He goes, "That dog hate everybody at the party." I go, "I'm the only one that doesn't really like animals. Like I have it doesn't, it doesn't matter. not well. The reason why is because I, I yes, I break out in hives when mm -hmm. they, when when every time they get fur my hives, mm -hmm. I look like a blowfish after I get near a dog. Yeah, I just remembered. You remember the story I just told you about him not being able to hold it, uh, uh, shake it with anybody? Yes, hands? yes, yes. Okay, we went climbing. After that happened, and he claimed, want to sit down? Yeah, yeah, good. After he, after he claimed that he can't shake his hand, we went climbing to uh -huh. in, uh, Malibu, free climbing without ropes or anything. And I taught him how to climb. I used to climb a little bit, now I'm terrified of heights. But back then, I don't know why I did it. I would go climbing, and this guy would climb with me. And I would teach him, don't go across, don't go over across. Always three points, either two hands and in in, in one foot at the, on the rock, or you know two feet in one hand. And he kind of made a mistake right below me, and he got stuck. And I had just had my surgeries on my my leg and everything. I could barely walk, but I was climbing. And I reached down there with my bad foot, mm -hmm. and I go grab my foot, and with this bad hand that he couldn't shook, shake anybody's hand with. He grabbed my ankle and had his whole body weight was, was on this and I pulled him up. Almost his whole body weight. He still had a foot on the rock and everything. So he had no problem grabbing anything. He was grabbing my ankle like like anybody else would. And after that I went right back to the limp hand and everything, shaking people's hands like that. So how, how did you feel when 2008 came? You weren't, you're not crazy, your suspicions were right, it's on the news, he was arrested, a woman got away. It's the greatest day of my life. 
I can tell you. I carried this around with me, all the suspicions. I couldn't brew it. It was the most frustrating thing. Do you me feel guilty for Amy? No. I mean... Is that I why? Think, I, think about, I think about a lot of things how I feel guilty. I should, probably when, when I pulled him up on that rock there, I probably should have kicked him in the face and made him fall. <laughs> you understand? I mean, it sounds terrible, but things like that go through your head. I mean, lives could have saved. How many people do you think, uh, can you say? A couple dozen, maybe. That day he's killed? Mm-hmm. A couple dozen, maybe. God. And... You know, I mean, there was no... How did you find out that, that he was arrested? Oh, yeah, I got something else before we get there. Oh, okay. Okay, that's really important. Um... I, I, I don't know, Some, I have mixed feelings about this, I don't know if I should feel guilty or not. There's a lot of things I ask myself all the time, what could I have done, but there was really nothing I could, I could have done. I mean, I told everybody I know what I think of this guy, and there was no proof, I had no proof. I didn't have any anything, not one proof. Um, I think in 2001 or 2002, the, the uh, detectives from Chicago came out here and later on, last year, just last year, I met them, and they didn't find me in 2001. And all the things I had to say, if they, if they had found me in 2001, they said if they had my testimony that I gave last year in June in Chicago, they would have gotten me. And I'm like, why didn't you guys find me? I mean, I was his What, was, what was their name? They came out, they name? came, no. Oh, okay. Well, the na name is on, on, on the on the internet, uh, Detective Lou Sala. Okay. Okay, Chicago, uh, Cook County Sheriff's Department. I spent a couple of days with him in uh, June of last year. And he came out here, he called Mike and he said, listen, we need a DNA sample after his neighbor got killed back then in 93. I did my own research on uh, the dates because Mike was such a horror movie fan. She got killed on August the 14th, and the day before was Friday the 13th, and I'm looking up what movies came out, and Friday the 13th was the premiere of the movie Jason Goes to Hell, the final Friday. So you think that he was killing people on he watched, the... He watched, he watched that movie. They asked his, his ex-girlfriend, Allison, what, what, what did you do that night? And she goes, we wanted to see a movie, it was a horror flick, but we didn't get in because it was too busy, which is a, a total lie, I know that. Okay, I know this guy went in there. He would get off and all these people around him being afraid of the monster in the movie. You understand? He wouldn't get a kick out of sitting there by himself and there's nobody there. He, he feeds off fear. You understand that? So the more people were in the movie theater, she just covered for him, I think. That's my suspicion that, that she knew that this motivated him to do what he did the next day, that he killed his neighbor. He killed uh, Patricia. Patricia. I'm pretty sure that's what it was. So anyways, in 2001, all these years I thought this guy's full of shit when he was talking about the story in Chicago. In 2001 he goes, the, the cops are out here, the FBI, he said the FBI, which was where I later on found out that I had nothing to do with the FBI, it was Cook County Sheriff's and I got to talk to the guy that came out here to talk to him. Uh, and according to him, he called him, he called Mike, Lou Sala called Mike and he said, listen, we need the DNA and he said, um, and he goes, and Lou Sala said, we're going to send you some LA cops and they're going to take your DNA. And he goes, well, it's no problem, but I feel uncomfortable with them. And Lou Sala said, well, you know what, then I'm going to come out there and we do, we do it ourselves. And he goes, okay. But when he came out there, Mike was gone. And I know where he was. He was sleeping in his van. He had all his stuff packed. He was sleeping in his van. And then that was the first time that I started to believe him. They actually, the police was looking for him. Until then, I never, I thought he's just, you know, lying his ass off. So I see him with this, with this dog, with all this stuff. He was really nervous, he was really shaky. Talking about that, they're trying to pin this murder in Chicago on him. And I waited a few days of him having almost no sleep. He was so stressed out. And then I sat down with him and I go, hey, listen, you have nothing to hide. He was watching his place. At night, he was sitting there watching his place mm -hmm. for the cops to show up. And I go, if you have nothing to hide, why don't you go back home? I mean, you can sleep in your bed. You don't have to sleep in your van. You, you take all your shit back inside. You have nothing to hide. You give your DNA. And he goes, mm, no, I can't do that. I go, why, were you there when she got killed? I'm going to stop this real quick.